and uh, of course when you came in you received the worship guide and on the inside of that worship guide are some message notes and I've got places in there where you can fill in the blanks with me and that will just I believe help you be able to walk away with it and uh, take your notes with you today. So we're going to get right into this because we have a lot of things that uh, I want to share with you today. So of course as we begin we look at our foundation text which is Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number one and you see it there the New Living Translation. This is therefore since we are surrounded by such a huge cloud or crowd rather of witnesses to the life of faith. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And, and when it talks about this cloud of witnesses, really, the scripture is it's a continuation of Hebrews chapter 11. And Hebrews chapter 11 is a, is a whole list of people that we call those that are members of what we call the Faith Hall of Fame. And in the Faith Hall of Fame are all the giants of the, the heroes of the Bible. And you know, you know what Hall of Fames are. We know what they are in the, in the world of sports, professional athletics, for example. If, if, I, if I say to you, Canton, Ohio, and some of you football fans will know that I'm talking about the home of the Football Hall of Fame. If I, if I say Springfield, Massachusetts, you know we're talking about the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame or uh, Mass Basketball, rather, Hall of Fame. If I say Cooperstown, New York, we know that's baseball. And so we know that in those areas of the Hall of Fame, and there, these men are, or women are revered for their hits or home runs or blocked shots or, or stolen bases or all of these things. But unlike the heroes in Canton and Springfield and, 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 and Cooperstown, these are the heroes of faith. And these are men and women that are revered for how they live before God. And their lives stand out as heroes because of how their lives brought honor and glory and praise to God. And that's why we're studying them, because we want to live our lives in a way that brings honor and praise and glory to God. And so we want to look at these men and women, these heroes of the faith, because really the whole premise of this series is this, is if they could talk to us today, if they could come down and speak with us, or if they could run our race with us for a week or a month or a year, and, and they, could, they could tutor us and mentor us and teach us, Here's the question, what would they say to us? Because these are the cloud of witnesses. These are the ones that overcame. These are the ones that they lived in such a way that, that God has honored them and distinguished them among all the men and women that are in Scripture. And we want to know how to run well. Because I tell you, really, at the end of the day, only what you do that brings honor and glory to God is going to last. You can have an awesome name and a reputation arc, and there's nothing wrong with that. If God gives you that, that's awesome. But we just need to remember that only what we do that brings glory and honor to God is going to last, is going to stand forever, and is going to mean something. And so therefore, we want to learn from them so that we can run well. And so today, we're, we want to look at the life of one such Noah, a guy by the name of Noah. Now, many of us that are familiar with the Bible, even if you haven't been a person of faith or a Christian for a long time, many of you heard of Noah's uh, story. I, I doubt if there's anyone here that, that hasn't at least heard of something called Noah's Ark. Come on, is that right? I mean, everybody, uh, for the most part, has heard of Noah if you're old enough. And that's what we're going to look at, Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 7. And this is kind of giving us a summary of why Noah is in the Faith Hall of Fame. And in the Faith Hall of Fame, it, it, you know, it's very interesting because uh, uh, the, the, the entire chapter describes men and women who lived by faith. And, and I think it's, it's an interesting perspective because there's several, there's several angles that we can look at when we talk about faith. There is saving faith. That's, that's faith when, you, when it dawns upon you that, that you are in need of salvation. That you're in need of a Savior and and, and you recognize that Jesus is Savior, and, and you recognize where you are relative to Him, and, and your heart cries out, there is faith to be saved. That's saving faith. And then there's, there's the faith that can receive something from God, whether it's a, it's a miracle, it's a blessing, it's, a, it's some kind of benefit, it's some kind of favor of, of God, some type of God's grace coming to your life. You see that often in the ministry of Jesus, Old Testament and New Testament, for example, he would say, be it unto you according to your faith. In other words, that is faith 
that received something that God has made available by His grace. That's faith that receives or faith that lays hold. That's the same faith that Jesus spoke of when He was with the disciples in Mark chapter 11. When He said, have faith in God or have the God kind of faith. Whoever says to the mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, doesn't doubt in his heart. Right? His heart is clean and, and clear regarding what God said, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass. He shall what? Have whatsoever he says. That's a certain aspect of faith. That's faith that receives. That's faith that moves a mountain. That's faith that obtains a promise that he's made available. But then there's another aspect of faith, and I believe really when you look at Hebrews chapter 11, this is the category or the aspect of faith that is really highlighted in this chapter. And that is faith that looks at life from a certain perspective. That the highest goal of life is to bring pleasure and honor and glory to God. And so it is faith that motivates you to live in such a way where your life brings honor to Him. It's faith that kind of says, you know what, it's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's about what He wants. And with, when you look at Hebrews chapter 11, it's very interesting because you see phrases like this, by faith, Noah did this. By faith, this person did that. By faith, this person did that. And for the most part, it isn't even them receiving something. Many times it's them by faith making decisions and living in such a way that their life brought pleasure and honor and glory to God. And I want to submit to you today that that really is the highest motivation of faith. And that is to live in our lives in such a way that it brings honor and fame and glory and praise to God. That's the highest aim of faith. And that's why it's so good to study these uh, these heroes of the faith. So with that, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. And so the question is, what is it? How did, did, did Noah get into the faith hall of fame? Let's read it together. You have it there in your notes. Ready? Read. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. All right. So we see that uh, here's the, the, the basic story of, uh, of how Noah ends up here. And we, we, we break it down. We can see that by faith he was warned. Noah received a warning from God. And he received a warning about things that had never even been seen before which means he had no grid for it. He had no template. He had no example of what he was warned about. And yet, without an example, without a mentor, without a teacher, without any previous experience of what God warned him about, what does he do? He does this crazy thing. And, and this is the summary. We're going to open it up and, and look more into Noah's life. He builds this ark, right, which is this large, huge, massive boat. He builds this ark. And, and, and when he builds this ark, he, he, then, he then allows his family to be saved because of this ark. And in building this ark, he brings a condemnation or a judgment to his generation who had chosen not to believe in God. And as a result of that, because of his trust in God, because of his obedience to God, the Bible says that he received the position of righteousness or right standing with God. He wasn't looking, doing something to try to be right with God. He was just wanting to please God. And as a result of a pleasing God, God declared him a man who was righteous. Now, here's the bottom line of, of what all of this means today, and that is the main idea. Here's your first writing. The main idea. We, we could summarize the story of Noah's ark real quick, can't we? Come on, Noah built an ark because God told him, right? And he, what did he tell him? He told him it's going to rain, right? Tell him it's going to rain or it's going to flood. He builds the ark. Of course, as we know, his family goes into the ark. And just like God said, it happened just like he said. The earth was flooded. Right? The earth was flooded to destroy the wickedness that was in the earth. It was a judgment. And of course, Noah's family was saved. But, but here's the interesting thing. At the end of the day, here's what we learn. Main idea, it pays to obey God. 
And that's, that's really the first right. And if, so if there's a main idea, and that's your first right in, if there's a main idea to this message, and that is it pays to obey God. So really, what's interesting is by faith, Noah obeyed God. Noah obeyed God. That's really the hallmark of Noah's life. Noah obeyed God. And, and, but, but here's the interesting question. What motivated him to do this? I mean, when we, we, look, at, uh, we look at the situation, and uh, it had never rained before. It had never flooded before. Uh, he had no experience of this. Sure, it's easy for us today to look at Noah's life and say, yeah, he should have built that ark. Of course, we can say that now because it's, it's easy to Monday morning quarterback. You know what I mean by that? That's the kind of figure of speech. You know, after the game is over, yeah, you can see all the mistakes the quarterback made and what he should have done. All of us can Monday morning quarterback. Come on, how many know hindsight is always 20-20? But Noah didn't have hindsight. Noah had to act right then. So the question is, what would make motivate him to do what he did when he had no example and he had no history of what God is telling him to do? Okay, and it really comes down to this, and here's your next right in, and that is Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God. And let's look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 9 for just a moment. Noah walked with God. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, the New Living Translation. They have it on the screen. Let's read it together. Ready, read. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man. The only blameless person living on earth. Hold on. Wait a second. Do you see that? The, this is God's commentary. The only blameless person living on the earth. On the whole earth, God? Nobody else? At that time. And he walked where? In close fellowship with God. He walked in close fellowship with God. The only explanation that he had to do what he did is that he was so close to God that he was convinced that what God told him to do was the right thing to do. So this is what I want to cap on for just a minute. Noah walked with God. And that's really what it's all about, knowing him. See, we, we talk about, you know, and uh, here in our church, we talk about the, the process that we're, that we're on a journey, we're on a path. And that first part of that process is knowing God. Because really everything in your life hinges on you knowing him. Now, there's a difference between knowing about him and actually knowing him. Because, you know, it's possible to know a whole lot of things about a lot of people, especially in our day, right? If you think about it, can't you know a lot of things about a lot of people? Yeah, you can learn a lot of things on television and, 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 and the Internet. Uh, there's so much information that's instantaneously available about thousands of people all over the world. You can learn all kind of stuff and never really know them. All right. And so therefore, you, but the, the deal is, you can be that way with God. Like you can know a lot of things about him. You can know a lot of things that the Bible says about him. But knowing him personally means that you know him like you know your real friend or like a husband knows his wife or wife knows his husband. There's a real close, intimate, personal relationship. Someone that you have a real personal relationship, you can talk. You know their voice when they're on the other end of the phone. That's what I mean by knowing. You ever, you ever somebody ever call you and you don't even look at the phone, but you hear their voice and you know who it is? Why? Because you're familiar with them. Noah walked with God. The Amplified Bible says that Noah walked in habitual fellowship with God. That means he was really, really, really close to God. Now, you know, when we look at his life, I want to just kind of give you a little background uh, about the, what was going on in his day. And then we're going to unfold the story to see what we can learn and what Noah would say to us today. But by the time that Noah comes on the scene, the world had gone really, really bad, really bad, really quickly. In fact, things went south drastically. You read in chapter 6, and we'll look at some of these verses, but you can read it further. Read 6, 7, and 8. We're going to look at some of them, but the Bible tells us that the race of man, when I say race, I don't mean ethnicity. I mean those that are descendants of Adam. That race, that generation of man became very corrupt. There was extreme wickedness all over the entire earth. There's a scripture in Genesis chapter 6, and here's what it says. It says, every imagination 
of the thoughts of every man was only evil continually and consistently. Now, I want you to imagine something, a world in which every man, woman, boy, and girl, every thought that they have, every second, every hour, every minute, is only evil continually. They never have one clean, good, righteous, wholesome thought ever. 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days a year, they are thinking evil and wickedness. And you know the scripture tells us later in the revelation we pick up that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So can you imagine what the world was like at that time? No wonder in Genesis chapter 6, it says that there was great violence in the earth. There was a lot of violence. There was a lot of violence in the world at that time. And so things had gone very bad. But Noah walked with God. God found someone who didn't think the rest of the way the rest of the world thought. And he was called a righteous man. And whenever God finds someone who will be different and go against the grain of the world, God can work with that individual. And so he found that person in Noah. And I want to talk to you today from what Noah would say to us. The ultimate end of the upshot of the story is that Noah built this ark because he obeyed God's voice. And I want to talk to you about six things that Noah would tell us about obedience. And as we do that, we're going to look more into the story about Noah and the ark that he built and why he built it. So what would Noah say to us today? Number one, this is what he would say. Here's your next right in. To obey God, you have to trust God. To obey God, you have to trust God. And then he would tell us to trust God, you have to know God. Now, let's look now into the scriptures a little further. Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 22. Genesis 6 and verse 22. And then I have another reference that's chapter 7, 5. We won't look at that. It says the same thing, but you can look later. Genesis 6, 22. They're going to bring it on the screen as well. All right? Genesis 6, 22. And we're looking at the New Living Translation. All right. Let's read it together. Ready? Read. All right, Noah did how much? He did everything exactly as God commanded him. Now, I, see, sometimes we read through the Bible too quickly, but let's just slow down and think about this for a minute. God tells Noah, all right, you know, it's going to rain, it's going to flood. The background is that the world is so wicked. The Bible says that it even repented. God experienced, uh, he, the Bible gives us the best way that for us to understand it. It says that God... Uh, God had a, had a sense of, of a sense of regret uh, for man's condition and for man's sin. It said it repented him that he ever created man because it was so wicked. All right, come on, that's pretty bad when, when God is expressing remorse over the creation. All right? And that's how bad it had gotten. And it had gotten so bad that God had to bring judgment because God is a just God. As, whole, as, as wonderful and as loving and as kind he is, he's also just. Because if a just God doesn't deal with injustice, then he's not just. So at some point, he has to deal with what is wrong. Otherwise, he actually isn't a good God, like we say he is. So being a good God doesn't mean he's just nice and surfy, sweet and kind. It also means that he deals with unjust things in his timing and in his way. And that's what happened here that he had to deal with. But here's what I want you to look at. Noah's perspective. He tells Noah, build this big, amazing ark, this boat. Who knows there had never been a boat built before? So Noah doesn't have an example. Noah can't go to a boat builder and say, listen, listen, I'm going to need a boat. and I'm going to need to be about 450 feet long. I'm going to need to be about this wide, and I'm going to need this many rooms and this high. He has no example, which means in order to do what God tells him to do, he has to be so close to God that he can hear the exact details of how to build something that has never even existed. Noah has no example. Noah has no mentor to go to and say, hey, can you, can you talk to me what it was like when you built your first boat? Like when God spoke to you and you built your first art. Come on, because we in our most of our lives and our careers and vocations, there's somebody we can go to. 
Come on, there's somebody who's, come on, gone before us and, and walked before us and has been successful. We can kind of look to them and, and glean some things and then, and then maybe apply it to our own personal situation. But Noah had no such example. Noah had no one that he could go to to learn from. He had to get his details exactly from God. Not only that, there were no power tools in Noah's day. Now, I, see, I, see, again, I need you to appreciate what's happening here. Noah's Ark, by, by, by the collection of all the studies you might do, was approximately somewhere between 410 and 500 feet long. Now, two of those would be longer than the Titanic. And even the Titanic, by those standards of that day, was a very, very, very large vessel and is even as large as some of our smaller cruise ships today. So I want you to imagine, this is not a little tiny row, row, row your boat. This is a huge, massive thing. Probably between 450 and 510 feet. And about four stories tall. All right? And so this is a, this is a massive vessel. And here's the thing. Uh, he built it without power tools. They hadn't harnessed the electricity yet. And learned how to harness it. They didn't have Black & Decker, folks. So God tells him to build this. So God, you're telling me to build something that I've never seen before. And, and, I, and I have no pattern before. I have no, I have nobody to go to and I have to build it. Yes, the only way you can do that is you have to be very, very close to God. You have to trust him, first of all, to do it because he's telling you that it's going to flood and you've never even seen a flood. You have no reference for a flood. You don't know what a flood is. Up to this time, it had never rained. Never rained at all. You say, well, how did the ground get, you know, continue to live? The Bible says that a mist came up from the bottom of the ground and it watered. God had an irrigation system. We're not slick because we got underground sprinkling stuff. God didn't have that stuff. Man, that's old as Genesis. Are you kidding me? I mean, even after the fall of man, God was still watering his, his lawn from underneath. Right? So that's how the lawn got, got water. That's how things in vegetation continue to grow and flourish. But, but Noah had no example. He had to trust God. And the only way you could do that is to know him very personally. And so he would tell us to know him, you got to trust him. Not only that, you know Noah got no encouragement. Because it said that the generation, as you read in other places, we're going to see, they didn't believe. So if they didn't believe, don't you know they're looking at Noah like he's crazy? Building this thing. And then he has to explain this to people. Which means you, you've got to really trust God. Because you're going to look crazy to everybody else. But that's why it's so important to know him for yourself. I tell you, everything hinges on you personally knowing God. That's why we bring that out in in, in, our, in our growth track class, it's, it's the first one. It's always the first Sunday of the month. And, and I mean, you, you, we can't exhaustively talk about knowing God in 45 or 50 minutes. But what we want to do is whet your appetite on, on how to go about your life. And, but I ask you this, especially if you're new here, come on, stick around for a year. And, and, let, and let God teach you through all the different series that are designed to, 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 to put certain things in you. So that if you will apply this and apply your own self to your own relationship with God and then and then hear the word of God. Come on, come throughout again. Every time the door is open, get in here, hear the word of God. Let the spirit of God teach you. Go home and apply those things. I'm telling you, your life will be different after that because you will know God in a better way. Okay, Because everything hinges on you knowing him. But here's the second thing that he would tell us. <laughs> this is what he would tell us. Sometimes obeying God means being misunderstood by me. Sometimes obeying God means being misunderstood by men. You see in that first verse, it told us that Genesis 6.22, it said that Noah did exactly what God told him to do. Now we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 7. We're going to look at the A part of that. Sometimes obeying God means being misunderstood. That's so important. You got to be willing to be misunderstood if you're going to obey God. If, if you are required for everyone to understand you, at some point you're going to not obey God. Because you're going to need somebody's understanding instead of needing his approval. Right. 
And so, so, so that's why it's, it's, so, it's so important that, that we know him. Because actually when you know him, then you know who you are. Amen. And when you know him, then you know who you are because the only way to find your real self is in him. Amen. Right? So when you, know your, when you know him, you know who you are. And when you know who you are, then you're spiritually and emotionally in a place that if even if people can't understand you, you're still okay. You're still okay because you know who you are in him. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So, so we never want to be in a place where everybody has to understand us in order to obey God. Because at some point, they're going to win over God. Right? And we never want to be in that position. But look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. And we're going to read this out of the Message Bible, the A part of that. Let's read it together. It says, by faith, Noah built a ship in the middle of dry land. He was warned about something he couldn't see and acted on what he was told. Let's stop right there. That's the A part of that. By faith, he built the ship where? In the middle of dry ground. Come on, a ship is supposed to be in water. So I want you to picture this. Noah, what are you doing? I'm building an ark. What's that? Well, it's a large vessel that's designed to be able to be in water uh, uh, when, when, when a flood comes. A flood, Noah? Yes, a flood. What's that? Well, if that's where water is going to overflow, you know, like the water that's in that lake and in that stream or in that body of water, yeah. Well, God told me that the water is going to, like, flood the entire planet. Hey, Noah, you all right, man? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. That's what God told me. Well, okay, so he's building this, and it's on dry ground. And here's what's deep. I want to get ahead of myself, but I guess it's all right to say here. When you look at the study, when you study the timetable of this, and the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how long it took him to build it, but you can kind of put two and two together from certain passages in the Bible between chapter 6 and chapter 11, and you can figure out that it probably took Noah anywhere, here's a, here's a fair guesstimate, between 60 to 70 years to build it. 60 to 70 years. We know it because Genesis chapter 6, I believe, tells us that Noah was 600 years. Uh, he was 500 years old when he begat his first child. By the way, there's hope. Amen for, for, for us all. Praise the Lord. I mean, if that's what, you know, you're believing for, I'm just saying. 500 years when, when, when Shem was born. That says that, Genesis chapter 5. He's 500 years when Shem came, all right? So he was 500 years old then. In chapter 11, verse 10, it says Shem was 98 when the flood came. 500, now he's 98. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. So we know that it was somewhere, and, and it says that when God told him that it was going to rain and that it was going to flood, he says, I want you to put your family, I want you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives in the boat, which means they had to be old enough to have been married and have wives. So when you put all that together, if he had them at 500 and the flood happened when the oldest was 98 years old, then somewhere in there between 60 and 70 years it took to build it. All I'm saying is for 60 years this man is building a boat talking about it's going to flood and it's dry as toast. And everybody is looking at him. And it has never rained. And he keeps preaching this message. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Now, it's all right. You, anybody can withstand mo uh, mockery and ridicule for seven days. Oh, you can take it. I mean, you, even if you're thin-skinned, you can handle seven days of mockery if on the eighth day it rains. Right? I mean, if after two weeks it starts raining and you know for sure, you, you can handle that two weeks of mockery and teasing. But how about a year? How about two years with the same message? Nothing happened. Three years, same message. Nothing happened. Four years, same message. You've been preaching every single day. Year after year after year after year after year after decade after decade after decade after decade and it's still no water. You are looking like a fool. Right? But guess what? Noah was willing to be misunderstood. 
Watch this. Apparently, he's not motivated by the encouragement of men. Because if he's motivated by the encouragement of men, he's having a pity party and getting a counselor. Because, man, they don't understand me. I'm just trying to obey God. All I'm doing is what God told me to do. I don't understand why it is. People don't just, no, he's not doing that. He's just being diligent, doing what God told him to do. You see, you got to be willing to be misunderstood in order to obey God. I'm telling you, I don't care what you're dealing with. You ain't been mocked for 70 years. You, you haven't been teased for 15, for 25, 30 years for obeying God. Come on, I believe that if we obey God, it's not going to take 70 years for him to show up and manifest what he told us to do. But see, we have this example. Why? So that we can look at Noah's life and run well in our life and realize that, wait a minute, I've got a family member named Noah. He's a part of the generation of the redeemed. And my family member, my cousin, my great, 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 great cousin Noah. He obeyed God when nobody was believing him. And when it looked absolutely crazy, and he did it, he was misunderstood, but it paid off in the end. Sometimes obeying God means being misunderstood by men. And here's the third thing that Noah would say to us. He would tell us this, and here's your third writing. You can live God's way, even when it seems that you're the only one doing so. You can live God's way even when it seems that you are the only one that is doing so. And I want to tell you, somebody else is always obeying God and, and living for God too. But how many know there are times when it seems like you may be in a situation where nobody else is, is wanting to live God's way? Come on, you want to keep yourself honorable before God, living pure before God, living holy before God, or making right decisions in business, making right decisions in, in your dealings, in your affairs with business and, and all that. And, 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 and everybody else is going the wrong way, cheating a little bit, cutting a little bit, doing their own thing. And, or, or it gets into a conversation about the social issues of the day. Come on, and you're the only Christian in there. Or you're the only one who is, has a conviction as a Christian. And, and, and so they ask you what you think, and you're tempted to just kind of be silent because, you know, if you don't say nothing, then it won't be a big deal. But if you say something, everybody's going to look at you, you know, oh, how, how can you think that when everybody else is thinking this, right? You know, the example like I, like I gave a couple of weeks ago, you know, you're out on a business trip, and, and it's all guys, and, and all the guys want to go to some, some bar, some strip place or something like that, in a place where as a man of God, you have no place be. Amen. Yeah, but we're just going to go and meet, and we'll just meet in the back room and just, you know, just have a conversation, and that's just where we meet. Well, you got a decision to make. Right? You got a decision where you're going to go with the crowd or you're going to go with God, right? And how many know peer pressure isn't just for teenagers? Amen. Right? Amen. And, it, and it's not always something as sensational as the example I just gave there. It's all kind of subtle things where you're tempted to compromise in some kind of way, or you're tempted to, or, or, or you feel like, man, nobody else is going the way of God. I feel like I'm the only one, but you're never the only one. But, but here's what I want you to see. Look at Genesis chapter 7 in verse 1. The New Living Translation says, When everything was ready, the Lord said to Noah, this is after he built the ark, he says, Go into the boat with all your family, for among all the people of the earth, I can see, come on, that you alone are righteous. That's a heavy statement, folks. I don't know if you realize how heavy that is. Does that tell you how bad the world was? I mean, it was extremely wicked. Right? And there's some deep stuff that it talks about in chapter 6, and I don't, I, I don't really necessarily will get into it today, but it's, it's just pretty deep, the stuff that happened in chapter 6. But, 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 but it was a pretty wicked situation. It's pretty bad when God says, um, you're the only one. And the whole earth, God? You've been to China, you've been to China, Africa, you're, you, I'm the only one? Right? But here's what he was saying. He was saying, listen, now you have been the one that has stood my, and done it my way, even when no one else has been doing so. And this is what this teaches us. That means Noah had no encouragement to live right. The Bible says in Genesis 6, 9, it says Noah was a just man, and he was an upright man. The word just man is almost a legal term. It means he always did the right thing. He 
He said he was perfect in his generation. Which meant, it meant his whole heart was for God. It doesn't mean he was incapable of error. It meant his heart and his attitude was always to please God. And the scripture says he was the only one of his generation that was like that. And here's what this leaped off the page to me. That says, listen, even if nobody is encouraging you to live God's way, you can live God's way. That means living God's way is a decision, not a feeling. That means living God's way is a decision. It's not based on popularity. And listen to this. He didn't even have the Holy Spirit living on the inside. Come on, Minister V was exhorting us in worship today that what she loved about one song is that the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us. Noah didn't even have the Holy Spirit in him. But that tells you, guess what? That you have a conscience because you're made in the image and likeness of God. And even if nobody is going God's way, you can still go God's way. That means even if all the pressure in the world is beating on you and temptation is coming on you like 10 tons of bricks, you can still resist Amen. because you can make a decision that I'm going God's way. And that's what I love about this. Noah is an example that you can go God's way even if it seems the whole world is going against you. There's no such thing as having to fall to peer pressure. Amen? Amen. Now here's the fourth thing that Noah would tell us. Noah would tell us, and this was a big one, don't measure your significance by your popularity. Amen. Noah would tell us, don't measure your significance by your popularity. And I want us to look at a couple of verses here. The first one is 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. And then the next one will be 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20. Now, they'll make these available on the screen as well. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. Noah teaches us. That don't base your significance on your popularity. Right? Because look at Noah in chapter 2, verse 5 of Peter. Let's read chapter 2, verse 5. Ready? Read. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Now, he's called a particular kind of man right there. He's called a preacher of what? Come on, he's a what? Preacher of righteousness. So Noah's a preacher, right? So everybody say, Noah's a preacher. So Noah in the New Testament is called a preacher. A preacher means one who proclaims a message, is a herald, a proclaimer of a message. Noah is a preacher of righteousness. Now what did he preach? Well, we know he preached a message to live right before God, right? And his generation that did not live right as a whole but he preached, live right before God. Here's what he says, it matters how you live. That was the message that, that, that Noah carried. It matters how you live. And so he preached to a generation that didn't think like him. All right, look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 20. 1 Ch Peter chapter 3 and verse number 20. Let's read that together, ready, read. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat, only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And here's what I want us to see. Don't measure your significance by your popularity. Because Noah was a preacher of righteousness for 60 to 70 years, y'all. And he preached a message, live right, it matters how you live. He preached, it's going to rain. He also preached a message of warning. That it's going to be a flood, and it matters how you live, and God wants us to live this way. And out of preaching for 60 to 70 years, a man that at that time had lived 600 years and been preaching for 60 to 70 years before the flood, and only eight people took heed to his message. If Noah's significance is based on his popularity, he is a failure. And listen to me, in a generation like ours, in a Facebook generation, in a generation where people get their significance by the number of little blue and white thumbs up like this, that are connected with something they quoted or said, we need to appreciate that our significance does not come from our popularity. Amen. Your significance comes from what you do before God. God is the one that determines your significance and not necessarily your popularity. 
So in other words, you can't be motivated by popularity. If God makes you popular, praise God for it. But it's just that we can't be motivated by it. Amen? No, no, Mo, no. Noah is a man who's significant because of what God told him to do. That also tells us how God views success differently from us. Right? Come on, if this is a preacher, I mean, no, that's, that's pretty low batting average. Eight people? And if you think about it, really it was only seven because he was one of the eight. And, and the seven were all family. So really when you think about it, other than seven people in his family, no one took heed of his message and yet he's in the Faith Hall of Fame. But he's there because of his obedience to God. And not only that, you know, there's a whole lot in these verses. Noah is a very important figure for another reason, not just because of the ark and the flood and the drama of all of that, but he's also an important figure because Jesus uses Noah as an example when he prophesies or predicts what it's going to be like in the time of his return. And he said, in fact, you can write this down. You don't uh, necessarily have to, to try to turn there. But, but he says, in, and uh, I'll just give you the reference. It's uh, Matthew chapter 24. And in Matthew chapter 24, he says in um, verse number 37, Matthew chapter 24, verses 37, 38, he says, he says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before Noah the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And so... Jesus used Noah as a reference to what it would be like before he returned. Now, what did Jesus mean when he says it'll be like the days of Noah? How I many you know if we're interested in the return of Jesus, isn't Noah a pretty important person? Yes. What was it like in the days of Noah? What Jesus said, what sounds like a plain statement that doesn't really connect. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. What does that mean, Jesus? That means that life was going on and everything was going well. When you're talking about eating and drinking and marrying and giving in the marriage, that means everybody was doing their thing, having a good time. There was prosperity. There were people getting married and giving in marriage and buying and selling and building and planning and doing this, that, and the other and going about their lives without any thought about eternity, about any, without any thought about what God was requiring of them. But they were going about doing their thing. And yet there was a message that God was saying, hey, it matters how you live. It matters how you live. It matters how you live. And Jesus says it'll be that way in the time of his return. And so Noah's an important figure because you know what? I know there's a message that says, man, how many know the world does need to know that God loves? Amen. But you know what? Listen, but the world also needs the church to be a standard. The, the world also needs the, uh, the church to tell the truth also about God. Amen. That also says it does matter that we live. It does matter that, that, that we respond rightly to what he has done for us. That we respond properly and see his message of salvation. It does matter. Amen. I know, that, I know they told us back in the 60s what the world needs now is love, sweet love. I, I know it needs that. But we also need to, I don't know about you, but if I'm headed towards a cliff, and I'm getting ready to fall off of the edge, tell me. Tell me, tell me, hey man, you going the wrong way, bro. You need to stop going in that direction. And so there's also responsibility of the church to responsibly carry the message that says, listen, there's a way that God has given us and it does matter how we live. Now I believe we need to do it in the love of God. I believe we need to be full of love and grace and truth at the same time. Amen? And so Noah carried this responsibility, but it was 60 or 70 years before anything happened. And here's what I love about it. It shows God's patience. Because the Bible just said in 1 Peter chapter 3, it said God was long suffering and he waited patiently. That means that this reveals something about God. He gave that generation 70, 60, 70 years to change their mind. Think of how patient that is. Come on, because some of us, we don't want to wait 60 minutes for you to change your mind. 60 seconds. What? You ain't changed your mind yet? You don't see it yet? Think about that. Think about how we are. 
Come on, if God is like we had been, man, he would have let that flood happen day one. Right? But it tells us God is long-suffering. He gives us time to repent. He gives us time to change. I mean, one of the most, one of the most outrageous examples in the Bible is in the book of Revelation where it talks about a, a, a woman who was teaching God's children, God's people to fornicate. They were, they were, they were a, a, like, a, like an apostle or a teacher. They were a false teacher. This is in Revelation chapter 18. I, you'll see that there. And, it, and her name was assigned, it was assigned the name Jezebel. And, and I don't know if it was spiritually speaking, that wasn't necessarily just talking about the woman in Kings. But it said that, that she was teaching, God says, my people to commit fornication. Now, it's one thing for somebody to be committing fornication and kind of living in the dark and living a double life. That's one thing. And that's bad. Come on, how many say, that? say that's bad. But it's another thing for somebody to stand up and teach it. This is what was happening. This is what this woman was doing in the scripture. And the Bible says, but I giving her space to repent. So then hopes that she may change and come back the right way. Now, if God will give someone space to repent and they're standing up teaching his people to do the wrong thing. Who mean no God is long suffering? Amen. So that reveals the patience in the heart of God. So never measure your significance by your popularity. Measure it by, did you do what God said? Amen. Did you do what God told you to do? That's what you measure by. God has a different measurement of success than we do. And what you want to be motivi motivated by is the reward that comes from him. Amen. Here's, what, here's what Noah would tell us. Number five. And I, I put this in, in, the, in the bracket, men in particular, because Noah models biblical manhood for us. Your obedience to God creates, here's your right hand, security for your family. Amen. Your obedience to God creates security for your family. This is true of any head of household, but it is particularly important in our generation in which we appreciate as men that Noah is a man who is leading his family. He is the spiritual leader in his household. And he is showing and exhibiting leadership. We see this model by him acting on what God said. And he, listen, and he's probably getting not necessarily, necessarily support even from his family. We don't necessarily know that his family is encouraging him. Doesn't mean they weren't encouraging him, but what if they weren't? What are you going to do if they don't understand? You got to obey God. Amen. Somebody say, I got to obey God. Right. He's a model because by his obedience, what did it do? It created security for his family. Because when the flood came, guess what? They had safety. Why? Because he had obeyed what God told him to do. See, when we men obey what God tells us to do, it creates safety for our families. Amen. Let's look at this in the scripture real quick. And we're going to unhook here in just a moment. Genesis 6, 7 rather. Verses 6 and 7. They'll bring it onto the screen. Genesis chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. Let's read it together. Ready, read. Noah was 600 years old when the flood covered the earth. Next, he went on board the boat to escape the flood. He and his wife and his sons and their wives. All right, verse 10 through 13. After seven days, the waters of the flood came and covered the earth. When Noah was 600 years old, on the 17th day of the second month, all the underground waters erupted from the earth and the rain fell in mightily, torrents from the sky. Now let's just pause right there for just a moment. I mean, we've seen just in the last decade the power of a whole lot of water in a short time. If people have doubted Noah's ark, we knew when we had hurricanes about a decade ago. And New Orleans could tell you the power of water. And that was just rain from above that hit the waters in, on the seacoast that was there. How about the tsunamis that we've had in the Far East? The one in Sri Lanka that came and over 30,000 people reported dead a month after it happened. That's the power of a whole lot of water. Let's keep reading what happened. Next verse says this. The rain continued to fall for 40 days and 40 nights. So you had water 
from above 40 days and 40 nights. Come on, even in Tampa. Come on, even in different parts of the country last year when it rained a lot in Texas, remember you seeing people rowing down the street? Water coming up to the roofs, And that's not 40 days and 40 nights. Cats and dogs without mercy. But imagine 40 days, 40 nights, and water from under the ground. So you have both of these on top of each other, and that explains the flood. Let's keep reading. That the very, the very day Noah had gone into the boat with his wife and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. All right, let's drop down now to verse number 17 and 18. For 40 days, the flood waters grew deeper, covering the ground and lifting the boat high above the earth. In verse 18, as the waters rose higher and higher above the ground, the boat floated safely on the surface. You see, they were in a place of safety because Noah dared to obey God. And that's true wherever we are, wherever your family life is, as a single, it doesn't matter. If you obey God, it will create an ark of safety for you. Praise God. Amen. They were safe because a man obeyed God. Proverbs 14, 26. Let's look at that real quickly. Let's read it together. Ready? Read. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence, and his children will have a place of refuge. Right? Noah models biblical manhood that obeys God and his children have a place of safety. And here's the last thing that Noah would tell us. And that's number six. Here's your last write in. Worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. In Genesis chapter 8 and verse number 15, I begin reading. It says it this way, and this is the, the New King James, Genesis 8 chapter 15. It says, then God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark, you and your wife, your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all the flesh that is with you, birds and cattle, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. And every animal, creeping thing, every bird, whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. Verse 20. And then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And he took of what? Every clean animal. He took a sample of how many clean animals? Every clean animal of every clean bird. And he did what? Offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. And then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. Then later you tell, you see it again, God blesses Noah and he blesses his sons. And he says to them again, be fruitful and multiply. The blessing of God comes on them. Why? Noah would tell you this, worship God. Because here's what I know about everyone in here. Whether you came in singing today, lifting your hands today, giving praise, whether you were that way or not, here's what I know about every single one of you, and that is every one of you, including me, is a worshiper. Everyone is a worshiper because everyone is designed to worship something. The only question is, who or what will we worship? But there's no question that we're all worshipers. Our hearts were designed to be overwhelmed and in awe of something. Our hearts were meant to be given to something with our whole being. Now, it can be God or it can be something else, but everybody's a worshiper, so we might as well worship the one who is worthy of worship. And that is worship the Lord. As soon as Noah gets out of the boat, he builds an altar. That means he had a lifestyle of worshiping God. He recognized who God was, that God alone is worthy of worship. And I tell you, if we don't give our worship to God, you're going to give it to the next best buzz that you can find. Now, that buzz might be shopping. That buzz might be sexual immorality. That buzz might be golf. That buzz might be some things that even of themselves are legitimate, cool things to do. But if they take the place of him and they capture your heart more than him, 
then it has become an object of worship. And any object of worship other than him, the Bible calls an idol. And so we need to follow Noah's example, and that is give the worship to whom it belongs, and that is to God. It's said that he took, I'm closing, that of every clean animal, and he offered it as a sacrifice. I don't know about you, but there was a bunch of animals on that boat. And there were a lot of them that were clean, a lot of them that were unclean. But do you realize how much sacrifice that is? Do you realize all the animals have to be killed? The blood has to be drained. He has to prepare the fire. He has to do all those things to offer them up. He has given his whole heart to worship God. And I want to encourage you, why don't you give him yours as well? Because I tell you, when we follow that example, we'll end up living a life that, like Noah, pleased God. And it brought honor to him. Did you get anything out of the word of God today? Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus.